Hey everybody, thanks for coming today. Uh, we're gonna take a few, just a couple of minutes. Um, I know it's 11 right now, but we, we opened a little bit late. So I'll take about two minutes um, to let everybody in and um, uh, we will start our webinar. Um, I'm really glad to see everybody today. Uh, ethno, uh, ethnobotany is a just a fascinating subject to me. Um, and I think it'll be a fascinating subject to you all as well, uh, just to know how native plants have been used in in uh, in history and today, um, and what their uses were uh, is is very fascinating. So um, let's uh, go ahead and see where everybody's from, really, just for a minute. Why don't you put it in the chat? And somebody beat me to even saying that. So Mark in, in Land Lakes, that's great. Um, High Springs and Volusia and Duval, Trinity, Collier, Key West. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Tampa, or I'm sorry, Tallahassee and Pinellas County, Broward. We, well, we've got a lot of them. Thank you guys for coming. Like I said, I think you're gonna love this one. Okay, why don't we, uh, let me see here. Okay, why don't we go ahead and start. Um, hello and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Programs Homeowner, Homeowner Webinar Series, a series given every third Tuesday on of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, my name is Jen Marvin, and I'm the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Statewide Coordinator. Today, we have Jim Davis speaking uh, with us about ethnobotany. Uh, I want to mention our new initiative, the Florida Friendly Pledge. Uh, if you would like to do something uh, for the Florida Friendly Program, but aren't quite ready to get re your landscape recognized, um, try taking our pledge and doing something just a little bit easier. Um, just pick one thing on our pledge and try to do it for six months. Um, and you know, you'll know you see how easy it is to do Florida Friendly. Um, to take our pledge, you can go to our website, um, and, which is floridafriendlylandscaping.com. And as soon as you get to the homepage, you'll see take the pledge on the top left. Um, your microphones have been muted. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Please stick around until the end of the press uh, until the end to take the exit survey. Uh, it helps me give you the kind of programming you like and lets us know uh, how we're doing. So our presentation, our next presentation will be um, Tuesday, June twentieth at eleven a.m. Eastern on organic pesticide safety with Brett Boltmeyer. Um, so I am going to turn it over to um, Jim Davis and. Uh, we will, um, uh, I, Jim, why don't you um, introduce yourself to, and give us a little background and then go into your presentation. Sure, I got kicked off. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just load up my presentation again. Okay. Really so let me get started here. So Jennifer, which do you see the right, correct slide? Yes, I do. Awesome. I don't know what happened there. That was pretty weird. Your camera's off too, just so yep. you know. There you go. Yep. Sorry about that, everyone. Nope, that's all right. We got gremlins going on over here. All right. So good morning, everyone. So my name is Jim Davis. I'm the County Extension Director for the University of Florida here in uh, Sumter County in Hernando County. And uh, today we're going to talk about some um, some plants used in, in ethobotany. And uh, some of the ones that you may see when you're hiking or going on different trails and stuff like that. So um, the first, you know, the first one that I really would like to talk about is I have to start with palm trees because palms are one of my favorites. Um, as a horticulture agent, palms were my specialty. And so we have to talk about our state palm, which is our sable palmetto. And a lot of people see this palm tree growing around and and one of the things that I do is guided hikes. And, you know, when I teach people about this palm tree, um, they have a greater appreciation of this of this tree uh, in the landscape. So this is our state tree. It was a, it's a designated state tree in 1953. And um, 
Uh, it is, uh, it replaced a coconut palm on our state seal. So some of the old pictures that you may see, you'll see that coconut palm on there, um, which is right there. And then later on, they switch with the, with the palm tree. As you all, you know, when, as probably most of you all know, and this is something that I taught my master gardeners that, you know, palm trees aren't trees at all, um, technically, but um, a lot of people say they're grasses. That's not accurate as well. They're in their own family, but, you know, they're very similar to grass. They're monocots. Um, this is a wildlife magnet, and this is one of the things I really love uh, about this palm tree. Uh, I'm a wildlife photographer as well, and so whenever I see this palm with the inflorescence, or especially when the when the fruit uh, develop, a lot of birds and pollinators go to this palm tree. Hummingbirds go to this tree. Um, robin, cedar, wax wings, um, red-bellied woodpeckers all use this tree, including mammals. So 20, 10 to 25% of a raccoon's diet can be from sables. Um, the pioneers use this palm tree as well. And so one of the things they used to cook was called swamp cabbage. Well, actually you had swamp cabbage. You can cook it over the fire with some meat seasoning or you can eat it raw. I've eaten it raw. Um, it's okay for me, it's not all that. <laughs> uh, the only thing is that whenever you Whenever you um, do this, what you're doing is you're eating the meristem or the heart of the palm tree, and that actually kills the palm tree. So I'm not I'm not really in favor of that because, you know, this is a very important palm tree in our ecosystems, in our environment here in Florida. Um, we want to preserve this palm tree as much as possible, um, also because, you know, we have a disease affecting it called lethal bronzing, which you can um, which you can investigate and you know, ask our horticulturalists. And that's, that's taking out quite a number of palm trees in certain counties. The Seminoles use the berries to treat headaches and fever. And the thatch, you know, the leaves, were used to, um, to build like a roof over the shiki houses, used for mats, paddles, used for gigs, used for arrows. Um, they had a lot of uses. Um, for this palm for this palm tree, and so you can see the picture on the lower left hand side here, where the thatch is on the top, and usually the foundation is made of cypress. And here is the fruit right here, which the birds absolutely love. Uh, the interesting thing about this palm tree is that the petioles or the stems were used uh, in Florida um, to make what's called a bat, and this is the, this is the short name of the game, but it's called totally. And uh, this is kind of like a stickball game. This is kind of Think of it like the modern day precursor to uh, lacrosse. It's that, it's very very similar. So it's a bat, and uh, and they make it out of this petiole. And this is a game that's been used over four hundred different years by all the southeastern tribes. And uh, they used it to settle war disputes, um, you know, to play games and so on. Um, if you ever watch that movie, Last of the Mohicans, with Daniel Day Lewis in the beginning of the movie, where he and his brother go out to play a game. Um, with the other uh, Native Americans, pioneers, that is what I'm talking about. So you can see a bat in the Tampa Museum. Uh, there in Tampa, I think um, Dave Battlefield Museum has a bat. And you can also Google it and check it out. But uh, pretty interesting, pretty interesting uses for this, um, for this palm. So here you have a cheeky house. This is in Dave Battlefield here in one of my counties in Sumter County. And this act, Dade Battlefield actually kicked off the second uh, Seminole War uh, here in Florida. Very interesting history about it. So this is actually built by Native Americans, by Seminoles. And uh, you can see the thatch, the roof, is made out of the leaves of the palm tree. Okay? And it is very impressive. Look how, look how it's woven inside. So you have the petioles okay, and, you and you have the leaflets. And the foundation is, uh, looks like this is cypress as well. Um, completely waterproof on this is it's it's pretty amazing, uh, and so this is this is one of the uses common uses uh, by Native Americans. So next time, whenever you see these palm trees, you know have a greater appreciation. And one of the things that I also share with these palm trees is that there is not a single palm tree sable palm out there grown by seed planted in, in the landscape. A lot of them, most of them are transplants. A lot of them are transplants. All of them are transplants, really. So they grow really, really, really slow. So if you want to grow sable palms by seed, that's going to be great for your grandkids. Okay? 
Uh, it's not going to push out fast like a, like a Washingtonia or a Queen or something like that. So whenever you have a 40 to 50 foot sable palm, that palm can easily be 250, 300 plus years old. So think of that next time whenever you go hiking in the woods, you see these 40, 50 foot palm trees, sable palms. I guarantee it, that's one of the oldest plants in that area, probably a lot older than some of these oak trees that you have out there as well. So think of that, think about that next time whenever you go hiking. Another tree that we have is the bald cypress or pond cypress. Now you have taxodium, there's ascendens and distichium. And you know, the pond cypress is, is the, le the leaves are more needle-like, whereas the bald cypress is more feathery. Um, you typically see pond cypress in a little bit more harsh environments, such as these um, cypress domes that you have out in these pastures and stuff like that. And, and bald cypress are, um, are commonly found in hardwood swamps. Uh, some of them are found together. I, I, I can actually show you cypress trees with both characteristics on the same trees here in Green Swamp. Um, but the cypress trees is not another very important plant that we have here in Florida. And it was used by the Timucua, the Seminole, the Miccosukee. Um, the, the wood also used for the houses, oxbows, toys, coffins, drums, and the dugout canoe. So you see this, um, uh, this picture on the right, lower right hand side. This is a dugout canoe. This is probably in the glades in South Florida because that's the, you know, the main mode of transportation of the dugout canoes. What's, what's neat about these dugout canoes is you actually flip them over, right? You can flip over and hide them. They're not going to rock. And, uh, and here you have this young lady um, with these large spoons, and it's probably soft key spoons. So that's uh, soft keys part of the Native American diet. Um, so you have, you have this now, cypress trees make a great landscape plant, by the way, especially bald trees, uh, especially bald cypress. Um, they have one called Jim Little Guy, which is a dwarf, um, and uh, it gets about 15 foot in 20 years, so it grows really, really slow. Uh, so these soft key, you know, these soft key spoons. So soft key is derived um, from the Creek word soft key, which is S-A-F-K-E, or O-Safke, which is O-S-A-F-K-E. So this is a kind of like a um, crack corn, corn drink. It's kind of sour. It has a, uh, they say it has a, um, uh, you have to uh, get used to the taste. <laughs> and um, so this is all enjoyed by the Native American tribes who once lived primarily in the Southeastern United States. Um, for most North American tribes, corn soup is a common food but it can greatly vary uh, in its ingredients and preparation. So the Southeastern soft key is different from the Northeastern uh, version of that. Um, so the Northeastern corn soup or soft key is made by cooking white cracked corn in a large amount of water um, that also contains lye made from like wood ash and stuff like that. Uh, the mixture is cooked over moderate heat for about three to four hours and it's, and it's eaten either hot or cold. Uh, and it's used by eating using these large spoons, you know, these soft key spoons. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, the texture can be thin or kind of porgy type. Um, so again, it tends to be sour, uh, so it has to be an ac acquired taste. Uh, and it's served in, in most any setting where food is shared, such as homes or various community gatherings and, and so on. And as you know, so, you know, bald cypress are, again, very old plants, um, closely related to the redwoods that we have in California. Um, so... Um, but yeah, an underutilized landscape plant um, in a lot of settings, especially commercial settings, it should be used more and great for wildlife. So another very interesting plant we have is saw palmetto or sereno repens. Um, very common plant that you see that don't get confused with sable minor, which is a little different. So saw palmetto has a serrated edge along the petiole. Um, you do have a, you two, two types of green and silver. You'll see the silver growing on the East Coast. Um, I like using silver in the landscape. So I used to work in, in the resorts in, in Palm Beach um, and uh, very salt tolerant. And it's great to use reds and yellows next to us. Wonderful landscape plant. Absolutely wonderful landscape plant. And a lot of people ask me, hey, Jim, does it attract snakes? Um, of course it does. Welcome to Florida. We have snakes in every yard. You just probably don't see them. So uh, I wouldn't worry about that. But uh, it's drought, once established, it's drought tolerant, slow growing, and uh, great for wildlife. Birds like to hide in it. A lot of the songbirds, 
Um, you'll have towies, you have warblers and stuff like that. Bear, Florida black bear like it. It's not to say you're going to attract a black bear, but they like it uh, in a natural setting. So if in Ocala, for example, you see a palmetto is kind of bent down, looks like someone's been eating in the center of it. It's probably a black bear because they're going after that mirror stem. It was used in an alternative food source. Um, uh, so the berries, the new stalks are um, cooked or eaten raw. And uh, the Seminole is using for, you know, for fiber because actually that little fiber that you see, you can actually su see it on sable palms. It looks like little, little strands coming down from the palm tree. Those are technically called rains, um, R-A-Y-N-E-S. So they use this as a type of fiber to make baskets, brooms. They use it as fans. They, 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 they use it in their fire dance ceremonies. Uh, they still make it. They still use it to make the dolls. Um, the, now, this is a this has become a commercially exploited plant. You have to have a permit to harvest the fruit on this plant. Um, and the price varies. I've read anywhere from $1.60 to $5 a pound. Um, so you have people illegally going to areas illegally harvesting this, um, this fruit. So here you have, you know, the inflorescence, which great for pollinators, clear wing moths, the type of beetles and, and visiting that. And of course, you know, this is a medicinal plant used to treat the prostate and so on. So Florida is a big exporter of salt palmetto products. Now, I'm going to tell you before I move on to the next slide, one of the interesting thing about salt palmetto is that, you know, it does have a stem. So repens means creeping, okay? Uh, creeping, creeping stem. So if you're ever hiking, you'll see these, the stem of the salt palmetto, maybe crossing the trail. It's kind of like a trip hazard. Um, in Florida, uh, we call those gator backs, by the way, because it looks like a gator back. And uh, whenever you have a salt palmetto that has a trunk that's very, 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 very tall, very, very high, um, that's, again, probably one of the oldest plants in the area. So they have one, and this is according to my forester here in Sumter County, they have one in the Willacoochee State Forest. They estimate to be several thousand years old. I think it's about 20, the, the, the stems are about 20 foot high. It's monstrous. So, um, yeah, just a, just a very cool plant. Again, a landscape plant a lot of people should use. And really, saw palmettos look great on the corner of your house, you know, and um, it grows slow. So if you plant in a three-gallon pot, it'll be about five, six foot tall in about 10 years. So here are some cases of people illegally harvesting <laughs> the fruit. So uh, here you have a guy. Um, so this is an immokalee. And this is a guy arrested for illegally harvesting saw palmettos worth more than five grand. Okay, And um, so uh, all these kind of cases out there. You had one guy being arrested uh, during quarantine. And he actually was harvesting fruit on the deputy's property. So that wasn't too smart. But um, yeah, so it's kind of a neat thing. You can find the permit on the, on the FDAX on the website, the permit on how to, that you need to acquire to harvest this fruit. So other plants, this, this is button bush. Now button bush in my area in central Florida here is flowering uh, in full flower. And I know I saw some in Gainesville flowering as well when I was at Sweetwater. Um, now, historically, all parts of this plant were used medicinally. However, this plant's also poisonous. So you have to understand a lot of these plants that were used medicinally are poisonous in nature as well. Um, some of the things that they're said to cure, I don't know scientifically that's said to be accurate, <laughs> but uh, this, is the, this is the things that they they use to think that they cure these diseases. So for example, the Seminoles use this plant to treat the prostate uh, for constipation. Is that true? I don't know. Um, but you actually had to, you know, prepare these in the right way. And I always, I always wonder who was the guinea pig for this um, <laughs> going, going through in time. Hey, try this. But um, the inner bark um, was used for dental for example, the inner bark was used to uh, cure toothaches and stuff like that uh, to treat the liver, eye diseases. So this is what the Chickasaw and Choctaw use it for. Uh, the leaves were used as a tea specifically for blood orders and you know, blood disorders and fevers. Um, modern day herbalist, 
use it to stimulate the digestive system. Uh, but it does cause nausea, it has bitter glycosides in it, and it's completely fatal to cattle. <laughs> but um, so yeah, but so these are some, some of the interesting facts about all these all these uh, the plants, how they're used back in time. Some of it, I don't know if, again, if it's accurate, some of uh, the um, some of it some of it is to this current day on some of these products. But this is a plant that doesn't like it um, dry feet. This is a wetland plant. So you'll find it in the water or next to the rivers or lakes edge, and it's great for butterflies, especially like the eastern tiger swallowtail. And as you can see, all these beautiful white stamens, uh, much like a bottle brush in the nature as far as that goes. But um, it's a wonderful plant. One of my favorite shrubs to use in landscaping, I've used American Beauty forever um, in all sorts of types of landscape settings. Um, so... Most, I'm sure most of y'all are familiar with beautyberry, and so it produces these little uh, pink flowers in the spring, which which is happening right now. Um, and then around summertime, it produces these orange, these, excuse me, these purple berries, and they'll last all the way up till about December. And then the plants, the plant is deciduous, so it loses its leaves, but the berries may remain. So it kind of works well for floral arrangements. Um, it's wonderful for wildlife. And so birds, such as mockingbirds, they're insectivores in the summer and they're frugivores in the wintertime. Uh, so it's great for birds. Uh, they have one called Alba or Lactea. Uh, I've had that and it, it's a beautiful plant. It's not really pretty as a standalone. It looks good mixed in with the purple. And it's definitely not as vigorous um, as the purple. Um, so, but it's kind of hard to find, but it's a pretty cool plant to do. But you know, the interesting thing about beauty berry is that the, the berries, the roots, and the leaves were used as a tea to treat skin disorders, colic, stomach disorders. It was used to treat malarial fever because, you know, back in the day, we had a lot of malaria in Florida. The malaria belt was uh, Gainesville, Tallahassee, and Jacksonville. Um, so that was used to treat malaria. Um, this is a natural insect repellent. Now, I don't know if the science is there to state if it's as effective as DEET or picaridin, um, but this is historically how it was used for. And some foresters, some um, avid hikers that I know swear by this plant. So what they'll do is they'll crush this plant up, you know, the leaves, and they'll rub the leaves on their face and their skin. And it's said to, to repel mosquitoes, ants, and ticks. And this, this, these this chemical that's in here, or there's two of them, there's calicarpinol and intermedial. And so these are the chemicals that are said to be um, said to repel uh, those mosquitoes and ticks. And in fact, back in the day when it says horses and mules. So what the pioneers did, they used to crush these beauty berry leaves, okay? And they used to rub them, rub the horses. So uh, under the harnesses, of the horses and the mules to repel the mosquitoes as well. Because, you know, back in the day, especially in Florida, especially in South Florida, um, you know, and horses and cattle would die because of inhalation of a lot of mosquitoes. So, um, so that's very important, obviously, for the, for the biting mosquitoes as well. Um, one of the other interesting things about this is one of my master naturalists made this for me it is beauty berry jelly. And I don't know if y'all had that. Um, now, the best jelly, in my opinion, as a, as a native Floridian, a southerner, is muscadines. <laughs> Nothing better than muscadine jelly. But beauty berry jelly is a close second. I'm going to tell you, it's really, really good. So if you ever get a chance to fix that beauty berry jelly, give it a try. Another plant out there is wax myrtle and uh, or southern bayberry. So wax myrtles, they bury um, in the wintertime. They produce these little uh, myrtle berries and uh, this is actually one of the ones that's still out in my folks' property. Um, drought tolerant, can be submerged in water over months. Um, a very, very tough plant in that regards, but not the most wind tolerant of plants. So during a tropical storm or hurricane, you may lose, you may have some breakage of the limbs. Um, they do have a dwarf, a shrub form out there. But what's neat about this plant is, again, the historical parts of this plant. First of all, whenever you go hiking, um, pick off a leaf, okay, and crush it up and smell it. Just make it sure it's not poison ivy or anything like that. And a lot of these leaves, you'll find that they have a characteristic smell. You can actually identify plants based on the smell, okay? So the wax myrtle has a very, very characteristic 
smell to the least. And these, these are like little, these are resins inside it. This is a very flammable plant. So back in the day, they used to plant this plant around, you know, around the cabins to repel insects and stuff like that. But that's not too smart because it lights up really, really fast. And what they also used to do is they, uh, the newlyweds. So if, if you if you took a match and and um, lit a leaf up, like I said, it burns it burns really fast and it turns into a gray ash. And this gray ash is what they used to place on the tongues of the newlyweds to strengthen their marriage. That's what the pioneers did back in the day. Um, during the Civil War, this was used as a medicinal plant. It was used to uh, to make uh, surgeon soap, um, sealing wax, shaving lather, the bayberry candle. So about four pounds of berries, about one pound of wax. Uh, the Seminoles used it to treat fevers, headaches, stomach aches. Um, and so, yeah, it, a lot of great uses um, for this plant. And, you know, if you're a birder like me, this this plant, when it starts bearing out in the wintertime, you'll attract um, um, yellow rump warblers, which are one of the warblers that can digest this wax in the berries, um, which is one of our migrating species. So just the easiest plant in the world to plant in your landscape for a native um, for a native plant. And it has such an interesting history. Uh, associated with it. So of course, live oaks, I've talked about a live oak. Um, then you have different white, different oaks, you have white oaks and red oaks. Um, so the laurels and the water oaks are in the red oak group, the live oaks and the white oak group. Um, so uh, these oaks were used for different things. So they were, they were, the acorns were a food source for Native American settlers when times got really hard. Uh, they would actually use it in the soft gear. They would actually roast them as well and eat them. They would use them as animal feed for their horses. And as you know, it's used as wood. Um, the wood is used as fuel, uh, tools, lumber, timber. And uh, it's interesting, you know, when you typically see galls, uh, forgive me for not having a picture on there, but if you haven't seen a gall, it's like a, it's a little round, like a little growth on the tree. Um, other plants have these galls. So the Native Americans said that the galls contain little people inside it. <laughs> but uh, again, you know, when a lot of these native plants were not only used for medicinal, but food source, but also as dyes. So um, uh, this was used, the, the tannic acid we use as tannin is used to make a dye. So a lot of the plants were used to make different dyes, different colors um, out there. So, um, um, yeah, and this is an oak tree that actually is my folks' property. I used to climb on that when I was a kid. And I always love oak trees because I consider it kind of like a keystone species. Think of it if you wipe out all of our oak trees. Uh, think about what lives in an oak tree. You know, red-shouldered hawks nest in it, uh, great horned owls, barred owls, screech owls, po uh, possums, um, fox squirrels, gray squirrels, insects, arthropods, different birds. I mean, it's just amazing. So just think about the world without the oak tree. All right. So, so as far as a landscape plant, you know, Yopon holly, I always tell people, I always tell people up here in my area as a horticulture agent, if you can't grow Yopon holly, you really shouldn't grow plants. You should move in a condominium. This is about as easy as it gets. If you kill Yopon holly, you have, I don't know what, I don't know what to tell you, but this is tough. It's completely drought tolerant. It's really insect free. You know, actually the leaves are very high in caffeine. So, um, as you know, hollies are dioecious, they're males and females. So if you want the, once they have the berries, get the female. Um, but it was used, the, you know, this, this Yopon holly back in the day was used to make what's called a black drink. And this was used to, uh, in their fire dance ceremonies, okay? Um, the bark was used for to treat old people's sickness and nightmares. Uh, it is said that um, whenever you drank too much of this Yopon, this black drink, that it would come right back up, hence the name Ilex vomitoria. Um, this was a tea substitute, and it's it's circle around to where this plant is very popular for yopon tea. <laughs> it, it's a kick. <laughs> so think about kind of like Cuban coffee in that in that range. So uh, if you want to stay up late studying for a research paper or something like that, drink some yopon tea. Uh, and I have an agent now that makes it. 
Um, it's getting very popular here in the villages. Um, they have, and the village has grown. Um, they have uh, they have a mixture of Yopon tea. I know there's called Warriors Blend out there. A lot of different blends Yopon tea. Give it a try. I mean, it's just it's just really 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 neat. Now this is this one's a weeping Yopon. This is a dwarf. Um, they also have what's called a standard, which is regular shrub, and you can find this in the wild in Hernando, if you, uh, Linda Peterson Park, the wild Yopon all over the place. And uh, I have it in my folks' property, so it's great for birds and and for wildlife. So. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of interesting history with this plant as well. This is called Cherokee bean or her erythrina herbacea. And this is a this is a very interesting plant if you're a horticulturalist because it has just the most interesting shaped leaves. And the leaves are heliotropic, so they actually face towards the direction of the sun throughout the day. Um, in the wintertime, it is deciduous. And then it'll flower out before it flushes out with leaves. And so you have these red tubular flowers. So of course, these red tubular flowers are attracted by hummingbirds and sulfur butterflies and the like. And but you know, this is a this is this is a poisonous plant. We have a lot of poisonous plants in Florida. And so the seeds right here are red, kind of like kind of look like precatory beans, if you know what I'm talking about on that. And those seeds are definitely poisonous, and they're used as rat poison in places such as Mexico, historically. Um, so they contain alkaloids in it. So they can be severe vomiting and, and, and you know, diarrhea associated with that if a person happened to uh, eat one of those seeds and break that seed coat um, and swallow it. So, uh, yeah, and these, these erythrina, it, it's interesting, the, variety, the, the variation of this plant. Sometimes I've had them as a ground cover. Um, small shrub. Other places, they're 10, 15 foot tall. Um, they do have little um, spines on them or thorns. Um, but uh, if you ever run into one, it, horticulturally, it's, it makes for an interesting plant. And, and again, this is a plant that you see in the wild. Very easy to see, the, um, especially when it's blooming out. Um, but uh, And once established, it's tough. I mean, you don't really have to put anything into it. This is Carolina jessamine, not jasmine, but jessamine. And um, so this is this is one of our winter flowering vines, very sweet fragrance associated with it. This is an aggressive native. <laughs> I don't want to say invasive because it's not. It's, it's, it's an aggressive native. If you've ever grown this, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if I take you out hiking in the woods, in some places you'll see nothing but gelsemium. So this is why prescribed burning works very well because you have to burn that off and get the other forbs and other thing coming out for the wildlife. If not, it creates one one big monoculture. Um, this is another poisonous plant. Go figure. So the the blooms on it. Um, so this is a plant that that has been that humans have been poisoned by sucking out the nectar. Of the flowers. Um, or in some cases, it's reported from eating honey made from these flowers. Um, but sucking out the nectar of these, I know from I haven't heard read any cases from the from the um from the honey, but I did read a case from the nectar from sucking out the flower. It was two kids actually. Um, and it was a fatality with both of them. So this is the thing we do in the South. So you have plants such as coral honeysuckle. You can actually suck out the nectar of a coral, of the coral honeysuckle. It's very good. If you do it with this plant, it's not going to be good. Okay, um, so you get st staggering, uncoordinated movement, dilated eyes. You go into a coma, and you can it can result in death. Not only poisonous for humans, but poisonous for livestock as well. So, um, in one place here in Sumter County, we had a person's horse was on a property. Um, uh, kind of dry drought situations, and the horse was feeding. Um, uh, uh, he was actually, along with the hay grass, he was eating um, gelsemium along with it, and the horse was showing signs of poisoning. So we got that horse off the pasture. Horse recovered, but um, yeah. So this is this is the thing that uh, caused it. Now a lot of people ask, you know, with the bees, how it affects the bees. That's a Jamie Ellis question. Um, or Amy Vu question for that. I don't know exactly how that works with with the gelsemium. I heard that you know bees can't find their way or, or toxic to bees, European honeybees. Um, but send your questions or that, that like I said, that's a Jamie Ellis uh, or Amy Vu question on that. 
But um, again, this is a this is a very flammable plant, but it's flammable when it's dry. When it's dry and almost deadish, it lights up. Okay, so um, that's another interesting fact with this. So um, this actually plant was in my um, demo garden. I had them rip it up because we planted an herb garden next door and the flowers were dropping in the herb garden and that kind of upset me. So I was like, those got to go. But uh, it's a wonderful plant if you don't have kids or pets. Um, birds love to nest in it, has a nice fragrance to it. You just have to keep it in bounds um, in a landscape setting. So there, we have different types of passiflora here in Florida. Uh, this is this is maypop. Uh, this is one you typically see when you go hiking out in the woods a lot. They call it maypop because this fruit here produces around Mayish and pops. <laughs> so this is like a game uh, that the kids that the that the kids used to play um, a long, long time ago. They used to step on the maypop on the on the on the seed on the fruit and it would pop. And I've done it and it pops really loud. It's, it's actually pretty interesting. So um, the fruit and skin can be eaten raw or cooked. Um, you have to remove the seeds. The pulp is used in jams and syrups. I've never had it, um, but that's what it's used as. And the leaves were used for teas and tonics. And it was also reported to use as a sedative. Uh, there's actually about, about 50 European sedation drugs that have natural products of passiflora um, extracts. Um, now, this plant does have some cyanogenic glycosides in it as well. It's a butterfly plant. What do you expect? And uh, so some of these butterfly plants are, you know, do have these, you know, are kind of bitter in taste. So this is a great butterfly plant for um, Gulf fritillaries and our state butterfly, the zebra longwing. Um, but it does have these cyanogenic glycosides. So if you go out, if you go in a wooded section, you're not going to see deer feeding on this because that repels most herbivores. You'll see deer feeling on feeding on smilax and other things. The, the things that are going to be feeding on the, the maypop are the caterpillars from the butterfly. Um, so here's you have on the lower right hand side the little gopher lady caterpillar um, chewing away on this uh, on this plant. So again, another another very important plant to put in your landscape. And but look at all the cool history associated with it, aside from being just a butterfly plant. And the flowers are just amazing when they come out. Now I've grown up uh, having muscadines all my life. Some people in the South call them scuppernongs. Um, this is actually um, some of mine that I had on my property and I still had some from my grandpa um, on my family's property as well. And this is one plant that I try to encourage homeowners to plant, but you know, you'll find wild muscadine all over the place in the woods. Um, now, wild muscadine is dioecious, so males, females, so it's not too common where you'll see them producing grapes. Actually, this year in several places in um, Cypress Lakes and um, Linda Peterson Park, I saw muscadines uh, produce, wild muscadines producing grapes. But, you know, you typically see the large grapes coming from the cultivated forms. So if you're um, near Claremont, you know, Lake Ridge Winery, you get muscadine wine. As I said earlier, uh, these actually my uh, we used to harvest the the grapes off these and uh, get muscadine. My mom used to fix it, fix it, and it was muscadine jelly. Um, and so you'll have the black, purple, bronze, seedy grapes. They don't ripen all the same time <clears throat> on the bunch. They you know they're kind of big. Um, it's a pain to pick because you have to pick them individually, but they're very good and usually produces around August. Um, Carlos and Noble are two very old. Uh, cultivars out there that's used for wine, um, very good grapes. Um, here at the demo garden here, we have Black Beauty and a self-fertile cultivar called Isen. And you can actually find this in the nursery. We actually ordered these from Georgia, uh, from a distributor in Georgia. <clears throat> and just look under Isen, okay? And, uh, and you'll, find, you'll find your way to order some of these um, uh, grapes if you want them. <clears throat> They're very easy to grow extremely easy. Okay. So I, I highly encourage people to, to plant these, but in the wild. So um, it's interesting. This is a wild muscadine right here. 
the long stems were used as deer snares. So you know the deer trails that you see, the uh, as opposed to just using bows and arrows and stuff like that, they used, actually used to make deer snares out of these muscadine vine because the muscadine vine are very tough. They're very, very um, long and flexible and everything. So, <clears throat> so those are the muscadines. And then you have red maple, uh, one of our few maples that we have in Florida. This is really a wetland plant. It does not like dry feet. Um, so, uh, but it was introduced to settlers by Native Americans in the 1800s. It's used by cooking ware to make ox yokes, um, uh, you know, the wood uh, for them and arrowheads. Um, they used a sweet drink from sap, especially Acer saccharum. Um, and the Acer species were used for liver and skin disorders. Um, it's an interesting little uh, usage on that plant. And then you have Asclepius, who would have thought, well, this is a great butterfly plant for monarchs and queens, but uh, they also use this as a medicinal plant. So back in the day, they used this for pleurisy, to treat pleurisy, which is inflammation of a thin layer of tissue that lines the lungs and chest wall, uh, used to treat bruises and sore muscles, and the southeastern tribes used to boil it like a vegetable. Um, and when used with Indian hemp, it was made with, into a very strong cord. Um, so yeah, a lot of cool, little cool history facts on the Asclepius there. And whenever you use, I want to track monarchs and queens, it's highly recommended that you go with the native milkweeds. Um, this is button snake root or rattlesnake master. Um, so this is a plant that was used in, in rituals and purifications, um, at funerals. It was used as a, in the black drink, um, in South Florida as opposed to Yopon. It prepared warriors for battle. They used to make the rope and they used to take the five, you know, the, the materials off this plant to make rope and string to make sandals and, and baskets. As you, you would see from the snake root or rattlesnake master, it was used to treat snake bites. Does it work? Probably not, but that's what they used it for. Um, sap as a preventative um, <laughs> roots uh, and shoots were eaten uh, either um, cooked, and it was used to treat the fever by settlers and Native Americans. Uh, so, so it used to expel worms, I guess if you had worms, and uh, vomiting and impotence. So all kind of interesting <laughs> uses <laughs> botanically uh, that these plants were reported to, to treat for. And not going to go too much on that, but uh, this is marsh pennywort and used for respiratory ailments. Um, they do have this product. Um, I think this is from China. It's called Gotocola, which is used for burns and to treat wounds and healing. So yeah, interesting uses for this plant. Um, sweet gum. So this is liquid ambar. Uh, so this plant's in the witch hazel family. This is this is another plant that you should really take the leaf, crush it, and smell it. Okay very aromatic and you have these seeds right here this we call these gumballs and if you ever stepped on them with your bare feet you'll know it they're very sharp um but uh uh this plant was used to collect storax um so storax is from a sap so sweet gum uh was used in pharmaceutical products such as uh, an antiseptics um, yeah, medicinal expulsion of mucus from the respiratory tract. Civil War doctors use it as an astringent, dysentery. Um, American storax is used today in cigarettes, candy, and soda, and chewing gum. And uh, it's used today to treat coughs, cold, skin infection, bronchitis. So a lot of, a lot of interesting um, uses for this. Um, and also, this is something that's shared from my forester. So sweet gum, this is not the primary wood source, but it is used here in Florida. Uh, sweet gum are used in logging operations, okay? And it's called mat logs, okay? And uh, so this, these mat logs um, is basically, think about that whenever you have a situation in these wetland areas, okay? You have these large um, equipment that need to come in to harvest the wood. Um, these mat logs, so the, the sweet gum were used as kind of thing that like planks, okay, so that the equipment can run over it so it wouldn't get stuck, okay, that's mat logs, 
So, um, so commonly used here in, uh, in the Florida foresting uh, situations. Uh, so yeah, it was used as staging areas and, you know, for roads. Um, the bark, at, the bark is sold for boiler chips for energy production. So you do have these plants in Gainesville and others areas that use these by alternative byproducts from these wood sources for, for energy production. Um, yeah, in other places around the United States, not so much here in Florida, but for flooring, interior fini uh, finish, and it was sometimes called as imitation mahogany. And this is climbing hemp vine that you'll see. And uh, so you'll find this in the coastal swales and river margins here in Florida. Um, it's in the Asteraceae family. Um, Seminoles use it as a dermatological aid, basically to cure any itching. Um, and that was the, one of the main uses as this for this plant, this Macania scandens or climbing hemp vine. Um, and then you have Florida betony. I've had Florida betony all my life in, um, in our property, in our pasture, thought but nothing but a weed growing in my bromeliads and everything else. Um, and then when I learned more about it, I got to appreciate a little bit more, especially when I learned from it from my master naturalist. Um, because this is an edible plant and they actually fixed it for me and I eat it. And it's actually pretty good. Um, so this is called rattlesnake weed <clears throat> because if you look on the roots, it looks like a, you know, the, the rattle on a rattlesnake. So the tuberous roots are edible and it was used by settlers and native Americans. Um, this is in the, in the mint family. So it has a square stem, but yeah. So this Florida betony, think of it, this is an edible plant. Uh, now, whenever you go out, don't go out and start eating plants. <laughs> So uh, first of all, know what you're getting. It's best to, best to take a class on edible plants like we have in Dade Battlefield uh, by one of our rangers up there who teaches edible how to prepare edible plants. Um, because like I said, some of these plants are poisonous. You have to fix them the right way. Uh, and some of the parts you have are, are not so good and some are good. So I always tell people when you, on my hikes, no eating plants on my hikes. <laughs> so you have to know what you're doing and learn from people who know what they're doing. So here we have bamboo vine, green buyer, wild asparagus, cat's briar, um, whatever you want to call it, it's smilax. Uh, I grew up calling it um, wild asparagus because we used to eat the tips off of it. And uh, the tips are very high in protein. Majority of a deer's protein diet comes from smilax, especially whenever they do a prescribed burn. So it's, you know, prescribed burn basically blurns off everything. Smilax is one of the first things that come up with the new stems. They're packed full of protein for these deer and they love it. So look at on the right-hand side here. This is actually in Gainesville in, that, in the Natural Area Teaching Lab. So Rebecca and Jennifer, I don't know if you know this, there's, duh, there's a ton of deer at the natal area in the, near the entomology building, <clears throat> right downtown Gainesville. You would have never thought there's a lot of deer there. And so here you have the deer nipping off the, they did a prescribed burn in there. And so here you have the deer nipping off the tips on the smilax. Um, so that's how you know you have deer in the area as well. So we actually used to promote it on a barbed wire fence. We had cattle and uh, we had a thorny variety of smilax. And I, I hedge trim it just like a hedge. Great for keeping people and animals out because <laughs> you're not coming through wild asparagus. Um, but it, it did, the leaf shapes come in so many different forms, so many different sizes. Some of them have thorns, some of them don't. Um, and there's so many different varieties of Smilax. It has a very insane root system. I have it in my office, I should show you guys, but a uh, very tuberous type root system. But it's also used as a dye, as a medicinal plant, as a thickening agent uh, from the rootstock used in jellies. The Seminoles use it as a source of starch. It was used to make bread or fritters, which I've had, it's pretty good. Um, and the modern day uses include synthetic cortisone and steroid production. So all these little neat uses by Smilax that's everywhere. Um, and people are like, oh, that's by Smilax. Well, um, hopefully now you have a greater appreciation of this wonderful plant that's, that's out in the wild. Now this is elderberry. Don't con confuse this with Queen Anne's lace, but um, elderberry, elderberry is another uh, food source for Native Americans. This is a plant that is really a wetland plant as well, or a transition plant. It doesn't like dry feet, but um, it was used to make toys, textile dyes. Um, people make elderberry jam. 
um, pies and syrup. Some people actually take the flowers and they, oh, what's Florida? We, we every, People fry stuff in Florida. So deep fried, deep fried the flowers. Um, it was used in the medicinal plant. It's antiseptic, used to treat bee stings, but it does have cyanogenic glycosides. <laughs> so uh, again, it's one of these things you have to prepare in the right, in the right way. And this plant is blooming right now. And how about our wetland plant? So this is pickerel weed. And so um, the seed and the young leaves unrolled, young leaves can be eaten raw. Seeds were roasted, ground into a flour, kind of like a granola mix. And it, this, this is what some of the U.S. tribes use it for as a contraceptive. Did it work? I don't know, but that's what they used it for. But again, uh, pretty, pretty cool blue flower to it. Uh, not the invasive water hyacinth, okay? And you can see it's a great pollinator plant. You know, bumblebees, all sorts of different pollinators feed on this plant. So great for ponds edges. I never like to see a pond that has nothing on it. It has to have a lot of vegetation. So our different pine trees out there, we have longleaf, loblolly, sand pine, slash pine. Uh, this is slash pine. This is Pinus eliadii. And uh, so these are these pines are found in low um, wet flat woods. You can get turpentine, um, resins that were collected from this plant to waterproof ships in the naval stores industry. Um, this was widely used to collect turpentine and resins. In fact, most of y'all probably seen the old scars used from the collection. Now, this is an old picture from the U.S. Forest Service. And so what they use, they use these are metal, um, that they used to hammer it in into the tree and they used to collect it using this little like usually like a little terracotta pot and so they would go you know inch by inch down the tree collecting this resin and this this what it looks like it looks like cat whiskers and that's and that's how it got its name cat face i always wondered why it got its name cat face and because the leftover scars looks like just like a cat's whiskers and um so you can see these all throughout um, Florida. It's getting it's getting harder and harder to find them because the trees are getting older and they're dying. Um, but uh, so this is an old picture that you have right here. Um, these are old cat faces. So a lot of people see these and they you know have no idea what it is, but. You see, this is one, actually, this is an old cat face in Dave Battlefield, kind of healed over. This is, a, you can see the little holes and everything, but um, this is an old cat face right there in Chinsigat um, Conservation Center in um, Hernando County. So um, you see these and you're like, oh, you know, it just looks like a scar. But no, this is old cat facing from the trees. And and it's good to have somebody point that out for you that know that they know 100% this is indeed cat facing. And so I have a great picture from Dave Battlefield. This is actually one that uh, you have to know where it is. And so here you have the old cat facing. So do you see the marks, the holes in the marks um, on the tree? So when they place that metal down further and they collect it using a pot and, uh, you know, it looks black and everything because they do a lot of prescribed burns in this area which the pine trees can handle. But yeah, isn't that cool? That's one of the that's one of the few trees out there that you'll actually see the leftover markings used to collect this um these this turpentine, these resins from these pine trees. So a couple more um pokeweed. Uh, you see pokeweed on your hikes and it's out on pastures and stuff like that. It's actually poisonous to the cattle and horses. Um, but um, the young leaves are eaten in, as a vegetable when prepared correctly. Um, it's used to make poke salad. And um, it's canned commercially, produced in Africa and places such as Europe. It was used as a um, medicinal plant. Is said was treated to you to treat chronic rheumatism and ringworm. Um, some people have an allergic reaction to it, so it's said that you wear gloves um, when handling it. It has caused fatalities in people. Okay, so again, 
um, you have to know how to fix this plan. All right, then you have golem polypody or resurrection fern. So these are all epiphytes. Um, the uh, polypody was uh, used as a treatment to, uh, for, for sick babies. Um, the resurrection fern was used to make a bath to treat people who are mentally ill or to treat, they say, the um, to treat insanity. Um, so there's a root mixture containing resurrection fern and shoestring fern that's used for chronic conditions. Um, yeah, all these little interesting things that you have out there. And uh, another plant out there is American mistletoe. Now, you know, mistletoe is poisonous and people have died because of this. So from there about uh, a lot of accidental poisoning by children and cat and, and pets um, from 1985 to 1992. So uh, this four the genus there, four dendron means thief tree, by the way. And so this is used as a uh, in a Christmas holiday parts all parts are toxic it is a parasitic plant um, leaves are used for teas topical preparation by southeastern tribes um, and the four ginger is the only food source of the great purple hair streak so it's a, it's a larval food source most people don't know that um, but yeah it's a it's a it's a parasitic tree with mistletoe now having said that um, and you can provide input on this out of all my years of horticultures, I've actually never ever seen mistletoe kill a tree. Um, but you see, you'll see in the trees, especially the citrus trees out there, um, out there growing. I'm sure it could stress the tree out. So here you have the Carolina willow, and uh, so this was makes makes salicylic um, salicin, which is a salicylic um, from the bark to relieve pain, um, a cooling medicine to ward off fevers. And um, uses a type of root concoction. <laughs> to, so they used to so they used to cook the roots, and there's like a root mixture concoction, and, and the the warriors used to drink, used to eat it, and that was said to increase their success in hunting. Um, being a wetland plant, this plant is a host plant to the viceroy butterfly. Okay, so another cool thing. And three more. So real quick, black-eyed Susan, who would have thought? So Seminoles use this to treat people with sunstroke. Uh, they use it for headaches and use in teas and for colds. And they use the root juice for earaches and to use <laughs> topically to treat snake bite wounds. So those are the things that you used to use for Rebecca. And Rebecca is blooming in my neck of the woods right now uh, in natural areas. Wonderful landscape plant. If you haven't got one, get the native. And then you have coonties. Now, coonties, um, interesting plant. So this is where you get the flower base um, that they use to make, used to mix with soft key. Um, so this, um, so what they use, they, they used to pulverize the underground stem of the codices um, and then wash away the, uh, the water-soluble toxin called cycosin. Okay to produce a flour or bread, and it's very good. So later the, Seminole, the Seminoles learned that the process, learned that process from the Native Americans who preceded them, such as the Miccosukee and Palooza. Uh, and around 1825, passed the practice to other settlers. So about, by about the mid 1800s, there were several mills um, in Florida, um, around the Miami area. And so by 1911, this, this starch that had come from this food, this preparation was known as Florida arrowroot. And so there are several mills processing coon tea for military uses in World War I, uh, but all the harvesting and processing took its toll. And uh, so once commonly found in the wild, coon tea is now listed as a commercially exploited plant, um, which means you, it's prohibited from collection from the wild. Uh, I, I have never seen this plant in the wild myself, but uh, it's an excellent landscape plant. The Miccosukee, that's the, called this word, the Conti Seminoles, called it Conti Ateca. Um, here you have a seminal with a soft key spoon actually crushing down um, those roots, made that carbohydrate. And this is also the Attila butterfly, which is a, a species. I think it's, I don't know if it's threatened or endangered what the stat, current status is, but um, almost, I think it was endangered at one time. So, um, but it's, it's slowly coming back. And so that's one of its host plants. So if you're in the South Florida area, um, Fairchild Gardens uh, is one place I saw some at one time. So last plant, 
and I saved time for this one because I love this plant. And so this is Spanish moss. It's neither a Spanish nor moss. Okay, it's epiphyte. It's an air plant. And so um, it's a bromeliad. It's in the bromeliaceae family. So just like your pineapples and stuff like that. Um, now with the Spanish moss, it has a lot of uses. The Native Americans used used it to absorb unwanted liquids, bedding uh, from you know from their for their food. They use it as bedding and, and for tanning hides. I know people who make it. Uh, saddle blankets using this. Uh, they used to rub it on the newborn babies to simulate curly hair. Uh, no, I don't know if that works. There's an old story associated with this. I'm just going to give you a brief, <laughs> briefly on how this goes. Uh, his surname is Gores Gores. So this Spaniard, Gores Gores, made a Native American princess. She didn't like him. So she ran away from him. He chased her. She climbed up an oak tree. He chased after her. She jumped out and did a lake or river. So she was a good swimmer. So she jumped off the oak tree. She swam away. He had a very long gray beard. His gray beard got stuck in the oak tree. And so he couldn't get down. So he died. And so all of his people came looking for him. They couldn't find him because with all the Spanish moss and the trees with his gray beard, they never find him. So he ended up dead in the oak tree. <laughs> so how these stories come about, I don't know. But there's different variations of that story. Um, but it was used for stuffing mattresses and automobile cushions um, in the 70s. So that's an old gin in Tampa. And I'm wondering that's actually, if that's actually the gin that my family took the Spanish moss to because my family was very poor in Tampa and Ybor. And so they used to rake the Spanish moss from the trees and used to take it to the mills, uh, to the gins. So a gentleman shared this with me this year. I did not know this. For Ford, okay, for Henry Ford, um, the price of Spanish moss to if Ford had to clean the Spanish moss, it was one penny per pound. If the collectors cleaned the Spanish moss, it was two pennies per pound. Um, so it took a lot of Spanish moss to get a lot of money. And uh, so uh, so they had these gins all throughout. Um, and one interesting thing about Spanish moss, too, is that this is something that... Uh, that we did as kids, I don't know where we learned this from, probably my grandparents, but what you can do is you can take Spanish moss, ball it up really, really tight, put it next um, on a creek, like on the edge of water, like a little pond or river or creek or whatever. We used it at a creek in our pasture. And so you check it hours later or the day later, you come back, it's a natural net. So you pull it up, you get minnows, tadpoles, a whole bunch of cool stuff in it. Um, so that's kind of neat. But here is a cool picture of Spanish moss used in a hanging basket. This is actually in San Francisco. And I saw this in their conservatory. I'm like, that is awesome. And I so want to recreate that. And you just shove it in there. And that's all you need to do. Okay. So um, Spanish moss with the chiggers, pick it up from the tree, not from the ground. <laughs> and uh, some people say to clean it, um, you know, stick it in your microwave. To kill all the bugs, don't do that for goodness sakes. Put it in a, put it in a plastic Ziploc bag, put it in the freezer, it kills everything. And uh, but you can still buy Spanish moss today at Home Depot and Walmart and those type of places because it's sold throughout the United States. Uh, but great for nesting birds, excellent, excellent rooster for bats. One of my favorite plants is non-parasitic. Okay, so it's a trademark of the South. People say that it kills oak trees. I come back. Well, if that's true, every every tree in the South will be dead. Okay. Now, it can exacerbate some sickly trees, um, but uh, it does not directly kill trees. So very interesting plant. So Jennifer, that is all I have. And if you want some resources, there's some references. But I have to give one shout out to this place or for, for, for the people who have not visited this place yet. We have a lot of great resources to the University of Florida. But I have to thank the Atlas of Florida Plants. So I asked them for permission to use some of these plants. If you have not been on there, you can search for a scientific name or common name. Get all these great pictures from native and non-native plants out in Florida. They're very, very, very nice. They're very nice to me. Um, they're willing to use their share their pictures as long as it's for educational purposes only. So I want to promote their, their website, uh, the University of South Florida website, and also the great, use, great resources, Florida Ethnobotany by Daniel Austin. Um, and uh, there's old, there was old Edith's pub. It may be still out there. They took it off, but hopefully it's still coming back. Um, but uh, I actually put both of those uh, 
sources into the chat box. Wonderful. And if you need, um, if you want a copy of this presentation, uh, Jennifer, do you want me to email you a PDF or how um, do you want Actually, there's going to be a video um, of this presentation up on YouTube. Wonderful. Um, so uh, anybody who wants to can rewatch it. Um, okay. And uh, it should be like a week or so maybe um, before it's up on our, our YouTube. Yeah, and uh, don't, don't be shy about emailing me. If you want a PDF copy, you know, I'll be happy to send one to you. Thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, um, I studied ethnobotany for a number of years, and uh, I just want to uh, reinforce what Jim said about um, not eating these or trying to treat yourself or, uh, you know, you, th these are things that people did a long time ago, or if they do them now, they're done in a laboratory or a, a um you know, some sort of safe environment. So, I mean, even with, I, I got called out once on um, recommending Beautyberry as a mosquito uh, repellent. The, the reason was uh, some people get um, rashes from rubbing themselves with Beautyberry. So um, just be very careful uh, and, and don't use, don't use these without knowing what you're doing or, uh, talking to um, a professional like Jim. So um, yeah, and there's a, if you're in my area in Central Florida, we have again, Dade Battlefield. So we have Kristen Wood and Kristen uh, is one of the um, rangers up there at Dade Battlefield. She has, has a class and she teaches people on how to cook all these edible plants. But like Jennifer said, you know, whenever I take people hiking on my trips, I tell people no eating plants mm -hmm. on my hikes because if you eat a plant, you know, the native blueberries, whatever, do you really want to take a chance ingesting a tick or anything yep. like that? I mean, do you really want to take the chance, but again, a lot of these plants are poisonous. So, um, yeah. but yeah, like Jennifer said, you have to, this is, this is what was used back in the day. And this is stuff that we're just telling you as far as, you know, it's the history part of the yeah. plants. And I did also put a link to, uh, FFL's, um, toxic plant app in the, um, in the chat box as well. So most, most people don't realize how many poisonous plants there are in Florida. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's why we came up with it. So yeah. um, mm -hmm. let's see if there are any questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, Kunti is, is it the sole host for the at, at Adela? Yep. It is. Okay. It is. And you know what, that, that butterfly is getting, you know, it's, it's rebounding. In fact, it's, in fact, in some cases, we have to actually have to tell the landscape professionals in South Florida, don't spray the coon tea because the mm -hmm. caterpillars are eating the coon tea and the person yeah. sees that and spray the cover. Don't do right. that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, let's see if there's any more here. Um, I've, I've got a lot of, uh, this is great information. Enjoyed your, your um, talk. Uh, if you do want to send um, me the PDF, I'd be happy to send sure. it out to people. Uh, I think people have my email uh, based on the the um, communications that we share before and after these uh, talks. So um, let's see. Yeah, somebody said everything is edible once. Yeah, true. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Why aren't the slash pine receding itself? I don't know if you'll know the answer to that question, but well, it was just... the slash the slash pine are that's that's where the pine cones come from. But you know that that's probably more of a, a forestry question. If yeah. there's, a, there's a lack of that out in the natural areas. Yeah. Um, let's see. When do you prune beautyberry? Uh, this person lives in Palm Beach County. Yeah. Good question. Uh, do you have to prune broody berry? No, but I find uh, pruning broody berry um, just after it fruits out, just before spring, kind of like January, February-ish, you can bring it back, leave about this much um, from the bottom, uh, about a foot or so, because, okay. you know, it's going to flower and it's going to, it's going to fruit on that current year's growth. Think of it that way. Um, also, what's great about beauty berry is that um, I, I propagated for a hobby a long time ago, and that was one of my favorite plants to propagate. And so you take three nodes down, take some root tone, cut the leaves in half. It's a very important propagation. Step in root tone and they'll propagate. And but the but you want to take the cuttings, the tips, 
that think of it this way, you know how you can take a snap pea and you can snap in half? Okay, that's what you want. If it completely bends over, that's what you don't want. Okay, so um, very easy to propagate, very easy to grow, uh, but definitely trim it back because it helps getting bush, it gets bushier and you'll have more berries on it. Yeah. Full sun, it actually does really, really, it flowers and berries very well in full sun, but it's a natural understory plant. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, I live in Wellington, Florida, a big equestrian community. One question always pops up, is it horse safe? Do you have any resources to answer this question? The toxic plant app, uh, the Florida friendly toxic plant app talks about not only humans, uh, but wildlife. I'm sorry, I don't know about wildlife, but uh, 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 horses, dogs, cats, yep. um, stock, you know, um, yeah, and down there, I don't know what county Wellington's in. Um, I'm not sure. But down there, um, contact your county county agent because we do. Yes. I'm sure we have a livestock agent down there, and that livestock agent will help you identify those poisonous plants out there. It's very important for cows, but and also for horses. Yeah. So it's a big yeah. deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely, uh, you know, your um, county agent is always available to you. Uh, you can look them up on our website. FloridaFriendlyLandscaping.com. Um, they're very, very knowledgeable about, um, you know, most things in your county, um, plants, what's toxic, yep. you know, uh, all of that kind of stuff. So um, please use that that uh, resource. Um, and let's see, that looks like that's it for questions. Um, Jim, thank you so much for that that wonderful presentation. Um, and if you do want to send the PDF to me, um, I will make sure that gets out to people who email me uh, through my um, UF email. So you're, you're um, very welcome, Jennifer. And we're I'm so excited to have you just producing all these webinars and great information for residents. So everybody keep attending and learning as much as you can. <laughs> great. And, you know, if you want to, if anybody out there wants to see what's coming up, uh, go to our website again and look under webinars, homeowner webinars. And uh, you'll see the list of what's available for the rest of the year and also how to sign up for them. And all of the past webinars that we've had over the past three years. So, um, you know, go give our website a, a look and you'll find what you need to, to find. So, Jim, thank, thank you again for, for uh, showing, you know, showing us today uh, more about um, Florida's plant history. My pleasure. If y'all are in my area in the next year, come with me. I'll take you on a cool hike. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jim. Have a great rest of the day, everybody. Bye-bye.